Good morning. Is this working? Good. Um, before, before I share anything, I, I, would, I would really love it if we could all stand for a minute together and, um, and invite the Lord to, uh, to be with us and uh, to do something amazing this morning. So, and I would also invite you to put out your hands. Um, our posture is so important in so many ways. So for those of you who are willing, just put out your hands and, and let's pray for a moment. Father, Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for this assembly of men. Thank you for joining us this morning. We welcome you here. We need you. We want to hear a word from you. And Lord, um, let me decrease so that you may increase. And make our hearts good soils to receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> so today, today is Good Friday. Um, I spent a lot of time um, meditating in prison about today and especially tomorrow. Um, I, grew up, I grew up going to church and so... Um, Sunday was just something you kind of looked forward to, as something that you enjoyed. You woke up on Sunday and it was just kind of Easter. That's the way it was. But um, I know now that today uh, we have to go through a death and a burial in order to get to Easter. And so today is a very important day and it's a very hard day. It's a very special day. And I'm really glad to be here with you guys this morning. Um, having, having the opportunity to spend some time with John and with um, Mal and with Ed and to consider what this group represents um, has been a really amazing privilege. Um, this, is an, this is not a very common thing, guys. Hopefully soon it will become far more common, but um, what this represents is essentially an overflowing of the love that has been poured in to those men and others. This is an expression of that love. And it's a very important thing that you recognize and appreciate what this represents. It's an opportunity for men to come together and to be in community together and to really be intentional about friendship. And in my life, friendship has become far more important than I ever really appreciated uh, it for, for 40 years, I didn't understand how important friendship really was. So, uh, I, John, thank you for having me. It's, it's a real honor to be here and especially encouraging for me to see men like you and Ed and others who are faithfully living out um, this walk because it's not easy. It isn't easy. And I'm quite sure that there are some men in this room. In fact, I know there are men in this room who are going through it right now. They're having a hard time. They might be living with uh, a secret that no one else knows, not even their wife. Uh, there's someone in this room who is suffering and feeling very alone. And uh, we need as men, when life does present those challenges, a place where we can come and encourage and support and love one another regardless of the things that we have done or the things that we may be doing that society will choose to reject us for. So I want to applaud what's happening here and, um, and encourage you to be a part of this and to be intentional about it. Before I go through any part of my story, I want you to understand that as far as I've come, thanks to the grace that God has poured into my life, um, I'm still a mess. Now, uh, there's no one here that better knows what a mess I still am than my son, Connor. Um, but there's a certain freedom that comes from acknowledging, I find, that I'm a mess. And uh, I'm not the same mess I was six short years ago, but I'm still a mess today. I don't, is anyone else in here a mess? Is, is there? Okay, okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one, but um, 
But the, I've noticed that when I listen to people, I am sometimes inclined to get in my mind the idea that this story has produced a perfect man, a saint. And that is not the case in my life. Don't get the misconception. Um, and I want to invite you right now. This is kind of a fun exercise to do. If you're a mess, if you raised your hand, or if you didn't raise your hand, but you now maybe appreciate that there might be freedom in acknowledging that, I would like you to take a minute, take 10 seconds right now, turn to the guy next to you, your brother next to you, and say, you know what, I'm a mess. Do it right now. Just say, look, I'm a mess, son, I'm a mess. There you go. That's it, that's it. That's it, praise God. So I, you know, I am, I am glad that there was this joy that came with that exercise. The, the laughter, the smiles I saw across the room. You know, um, that's just a very small taste of the freedom that we are offered thanks to the cross. So we do have the freedom to acknowledge our mess with one another and to, you know, we don't have to be afraid of being rejected. We've been accepted. And so uh, it's good to be with some other guys that, uh, that are a mess. So I grew up in Florida. I grew up um, in a household that was a mess, but where a lot of energy was spent making sure that no one else could see that mess. Um, my father was a rocket scientist. He was an engineer. He was a Polak. He was a Catholic. He was a lot of things. Um, he, is a, he is a very loving and dear man, and uh, that's despite a lot of pain and a lot of suffering that he endured as a young man and uh, as, um, as an older man, in fact. And my mother was uh, highly educated, very intelligent, and um, an amazing woman, but also a mess. And my house, uh, only recently has it become known to me, was a house of, uh, filled with adultery. Now, I didn't know that, and quite frankly, very few people in my community knew that. From, out, from the out, outside, it looked like a very perfect middle-class home. We traveled. My father started a business. Um, uh, I was a, uh, an extraordinary student. My younger sister was also very bright and, and pretty, and we just looked like the perfect family. And yet, inside, it was very ugly. Um, I knew, though, from a very young age that uh, my brain didn't work like a lot of other people's brains. And I, um, I recognized that, and I felt like I wasn't fitting in. And I so desperately wanted to fit in and be accepted by people around me. So I began to work very hard at fitting in. And what that meant to me at that age was whoever I was around becoming really good at being the person that they wanted me to be. So if I was around people who were really smart, I could act and be really smart with those people. If I was in a room filled with crack addicts, I was the best crack addict. And in fact, when I was 15 years old, I had a very serious cocaine addiction. So my life at a very young age was filled with this desire to fit in. There was an all, also another very important dynamic that shaped the direction of my life. And that was uh, really started with a, an incident that happened when I was 11 years old. My father fell off the roof, and I was among the first to find him. And as I stood there looking as an 11-year-old young man, my father's motionless body, a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness overwhelmed me. And that um, feeling stayed with me. And I decided at that point that I was going to do everything in my power to not be helpless and hopeless in my life. And that began to look very quickly like uh, going to medical school and becoming a physician that would allow me to, under any circumstance, be able to intervene 
when someone in front of me, or more importantly, someone I cared about was hurting, that I could try and, and actually make a difference and heal them. And so I worked very hard at school. I worked very hard at playing and uh, fitting in everywhere, but I was particularly good in school. And so I went to a very good school for college and was uh, quite successful there and joined a fraternity and was rush chairman. And, you know, I was everything everybody needed me to be, really good at it. On the day where all of those hopes and dreams about being able to address my helplessness started to become a reality, I was a senior. It was actually September of uh, 1990. And uh, I got a call from a school I had applied to, from the dean of that school. And when I picked up the phone, Dean Rosenberg announced himself uh, and wondered if uh, I knew who he was. And I said, well, yes, sir, Dean Rosenberg, you're the dean of, of Yale Medical School. And he said that he was going to do something that they had never done before and they would likely never do again. But he wanted to offer me a position in the medical scientist training program, the MD-PhD program at Yale, which meant a full ride to medical school and a, a, an amazing journey into a world that I had never known before, into the Ivy Leagues, uh, going all the way up to, to New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and it was, at that point in my life, the highest high I had ever experienced. This was a, a life work being manifest in one moment. And when I hung up the phone with Dean Rosenberg, I was on top of the world. And I was all alone in my house. Um, I was living with three other guys. They were off at class. And I just sat there just, I didn't even know what to say. I opened a beer from the fridge. And uh, I didn't drink it. I just sat there on the couch just... Unbelievable. I called and left a message at home. To, I wanted to tell my mother. And um, about a half an hour after I had hung up with Dean Rosenberg, I got a call from my father. And he told me that mom had been killed in a car accident. And so within the span of half an hour, I had gone from the highest high to the lowest low in my life. Completely helpless, sure that there was no way I would ever fit in anywhere again. I was the only guy going to Yale. I was the only guy who lost his mother. I mean, I was crippled. I went home, I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't bear the emotions would just overwhelm me just completely overwhelmed me like waves. They would crash over me, take me out for a day and a half. Couldn't go to class, couldn't do anything. Um, I came back to college. I finished my senior year, and I just started working. I put my head down and started working, running away from the pain that I couldn't bear to face, completely ill-equipped to face those emotions. So I went to Yale, and um, I found great challenges. I found people who were talented and funny and exciting to go through these challenges with. I met my wife during that time. I, uh, I chose to um, enter into the covenant of marriage with her, and uh, we began to talk about having a family. We uh, watched our careers move forward. We got a dog. Um, it was a really, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a peaceful time. And yet I knew that if I stopped moving, all of that was going to catch up with me. From Yale, went up to Harvard we began to have a family. We, uh, we both worked. 
I started the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program, working extra extraordinary hours. Um, residency today is not what it was back then, and Harvard was one of the more severe general surgery programs in the country. Um, when I entered the orthopedic program, I was surrounded by luminaries, amazing men who had devoted their entire lives to the pursuit of improving healthcare and saving lives. Amazing men, over 60 of them, all men, not one of them married to their first wives. Very few of them seemed to know their families very well. And here I was, a young resident, having a family for the first time, feeling like I was walking down a path that was going to cut me off from the things that I found the most joy in. And so as, as John alluded to, I made a decision to leave medicine. And I did not know where I was going when I made that decision. My wife was pregnant with our second child, with Connor, at that time when I rolled over and told her one morning, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to be a practicing doctor for the rest of my life. So I need to make a change now. By that time, we had been married long enough that she knew I was pretty unpredictable and also pretty decisive. So I did move from there, uh, from the operating room, that intense, focused environment, onto Wall Street a very intense, focused environment. I took about a week off in between just to move some stuff down. My wife closed up shop for us, sold the house in Boston, and I went down and began working at one of the most um, well-known hedge funds on the planet. That time for me began um, a new pursuit, a need to be excellent, and um, I did excel. Everything I set my mind to, I did. Within a little less than two years of getting to Wall Street, I decided that I would be able to do uh, this hedge fund business on my own and do it in a different way than was currently being done. And we partnered with Front Point Partners and two young men who I had worked with at that hedge fund joined me and we began our own firm in 2003. By 2005, we were managing a billion dollars in a hedge fund. Not long after that, we um, exceeded the $2.5 billion mark. Money, I had never dreamed I would make this much money in my life. And yet I found that the more success I had and the more opportunities I had to dream and think about the things that might make me happy, the more empty I seemed to be becoming. The harder I had to try, the more money it took for me to try to satisfy this desire that somehow was aching inside me. We sold the firm to Morgan Stanley. And in January of 2008, I received a phone call from a doctor. And on that phone call, I was told about a clinical trial that had a problem with it. And we had a small investment in that company. And I decided immediately that we needed to sell that position. And that decision and that action was the thing that would ultimately lead to the fall of Front Point an $11 billion asset manager to zero, where many families, men and women, lost their jobs and suffered great uncertainty and loss because 
of that decision that I had made. But it was bigger than that. It was not just about that decision. It was about who I was. That decision was just a small reflection of that. In November of 2010, on election day, we became aware that there was a, uh, a man that had been arrested, a doctor who had been arrested in Boston as he was preparing to go back to France. And that was the beginning of what ultimately led to my journey into prison. But I want to talk about that journey for a minute because although you may be thinking, and I certainly was at that time, that a journey to prison was going to be a very, very bad thing, I can tell you that looking back on it, it was grace. It was salvation coming into my home and into my life. There was no way that I would ever be able to extricate, to pull myself out of the wealth and the money and the attraction of the world without the Lord reaching into my life and ripping me out of that circumstance. And that, that is exactly what this represented. So on November 4th, I walked out of that office after that phone call, and I never walked back into that office again. I wasn't even allowed to. All of those people that I had built this firm with, hundreds of people, the offices that we had opened, I have not even to this day seen 99% of them. And there's a great sadness that I carry today with what I know that they've gone through. So um, it became very clear very quickly that life was changing. Uh, my picture was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post. Greenwich, Connecticut is a community that really centers largely on finance. There wasn't anyone, I was sure, in the community that didn't know what was going on in my life. And it sure felt like all of my support evaporated. Suddenly, I was totally alone again. Now, that emptiness that I had felt in my heart, that, that longing for something else, suddenly, with all of these things ripped out of my life, with that loneliness, I had a moment to stop and to be still and to think about the things that I had heard in church over the years, over the many years of going to church, the things that I had prayed and asked God for, the Nicene Creed, what is it that I believe, the things that I had said but really never had a place in my heart, I had a moment to reflect on those things. And there was a scripture that came to me. And this scripture is in all four gospels. That the man who would save his life will lose it. But the man who would lose his life for my sake, he shall find it. So how, how was it that all of this was coming together and that scripture kept coming back into my mind? I knew I was going to have to lose my life to get a new one. And that means everything. That means the money, the cars, giving up the desire to live in a big house. But more than that, my children, my marriage, my reputation, everything. I had to be willing to walk away from everything in order to have a new life. Something completely new. The circumstances of my um, decision to go to prison, and it was a decision, really came to a head on August 23rd, 2011. But the Lord had prepared me for that day. And he had prepared me because in the midst of that loneliness that I was telling you about, um, a group of men like this, that group is called the New Canaan Society, I am very much a huge proponent of groups like this. The New Canaan Society is mine. This one is amazing. It doesn't matter the name. What matters is that the group is an expression of the love and the grace that has been poured into a few that spreads to many. That's what gives this group power. 
That's what gives this room permission for men to be real with one another, to talk about the mess. Very quickly, I went from having no one to having a group like this. And in April of 2011, just a few short months after walking away from everything, the humiliation, walking away from the reputation, walking away from everything, I found myself in a room larger than this, filled with about 600 men and a man named Jack Deere speaking at the podium. And he told me about the great loss and great suffering in his life. And he told me about the man of Jesus Christ, not the God of Jesus, but the man of Jesus. And that man had a best friend and that best friend had a name and his name was John. And oh, how I wanted a best friend at that moment in my life. And I asked and Jesus showed up in that room. And he, the man of Jesus, came to me and filled me with a new life. And it's never been the same. Nothing has ever been the same since that day. And his presence in my life is what allowed me on August 23rd, 2011, to make this decision. Now, why does, that, why does that date mean something? Well, you probably remember that there was an earthquake that happened in Virginia back in 2011. It damaged the Washington Monument. It was a pretty big earthquake. Well, that day I had a meeting in the Bank of America building with my attorneys where the decision was going to be made. The decision of whether I was going to fight this and try to retain my reputation and my wealth and my position in court, whether I was going to choose to bring in a whole bunch of other people to my circumstance and allow them to suffer what I deserved, or whether I would just say, I'm guilty. And that earthquake happened in the moment where I had to make that decision. They evacuated the building. I had a wooden cross in my pocket on that day. And the tension of that decision, without me knowing it, I broke the cross in my hand. It snapped in two. And I decided on that day that I would go to prison, that I would give up my life. I would literally walk away from everything and start something new, trusting that Jesus would give me a new life. And it didn't matter what that life looked like. Whatever it was, it was going to be better than that. Whatever it was. On January 6th, 2012, my father and B.J. Weber, an amazing, two amazing men, very important men in my life, showed up at my house. I said goodbye to my four children and to my wife, and they drove me to federal prison in Schuylkill, Pennsylvania. That was a hard day for everyone. So I walked into prison and I have to tell you guys, you know, go into prison. I don't know what your preconceptions are. It was much, much easier than I expected it to be. In fact, the first really peaceful night's sleep that I had had in years was that first night in prison. It was over. It was finally done. Amazing night. The time in prison for me was a time of uh, extraordinary growth, pain, loneliness. My pain, my loneliness, nothing compared to the cost to my family. They suffered great pain in the four years that I was inside. Now, I want to tell you about the most important thing that happened to me inside. 
There were amazing things, terrible things, great stories, all of them. This is the one that has been the most important. Because in my loneliest time, in my darkest moments after two years of being in prison, I was still very lonely. I was going to church. I was on the praise team, Bible studies. I was doing everything but really lonely. I don't know if you know that Christians can do all the things that we're called to do and still be very, very lonely. That's true. I experienced it. And in the midst of my loneliness, I was reaching out to my brothers and saying, Lord, I, brothers, I need you to pray. I need a friend. I'm lonely. It's, I'm, I'm to the end of it. I can't do this anymore. I need a friend to walk through this with me. Now, in my mind, I don't know if you guys know Tim Keller. Tim's amazing. I know him. Uh, you know, in my mind, I thought God would bring someone like a, a, an amazing Christian. C.S. Lewis would be resurrected and come into prison. And that's who God would give me as, as, as my best friend. And no offense to C.S. Lewis lovers or to Tim Keller. God did better. Because um, one night, a man named Biggs Burke, who I did not know, was not known well to me at all, but was very well known in the prison community, came to my cell to talk to me about a business plan. And at the end of my rope, I didn't have the energy to talk to him about business. The only thing I could talk to him about was Jesus. And we talked about Jesus and life for four hours and it seemed like five minutes. That night, the Holy Spirit came on Biggs. And overnight, literally overnight, the Lord gave me, who is up until this day, my best friend. We were inseparable. We walked through that time together and it was an amazing journey. And walking with Biggs Burke through prison and now coming home has been one of the greatest joys of my life. We saw our love for each other explode in that prison. There's a verse that says that everyone will know. Jesus said that everyone will know you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. And we just enjoyed our time together and it spread into an extraordinary room, not unlike this one. It started with two, it went to three, it went to five, it went to 20. And at 20, we decided that we would have a celebration for a group of men who were leaving. And we didn't think anything of it. We just said, look, we'll have a little service. We'll, you know, someone will pray. Someone will be at the door. Someone will bring the word. Joe will play the guitar. You know, it'll be great. A third of the prison came. It was standing room only in the chapel. When we felt but moved by the Spirit to invite men to come up and to give their lives to the Lord, 30 men walked up. And when we invited men to come up from prayer, for prayer, over 60 men came up to have hands laid on them to be healed and to ask for prayer. It was a full-blown revival. And it just started with a friendship. That's it. So coming home on the other side has been hard. I was sharing a little while ago uh, that coming home was the opposite of going in. It was uh, in May of 2015 that I physically came home. But the process of coming home is far more about relationship than it is about any physical presence. And I've really learned to appreciate how important relationship is because coming home has been so hard. And I want you to know that um, every day I wake up, I am, uh, I'm encouraged by one thing, that I know that the very 
the fact of the beginning of God's work in my life is the utter assurance of its completion. And no matter what I'm going through day by day, and I go through a lot, I mean, Connor, I, he knows, I scream, I lose my temper, I'm a mess. God's working it out. Trusting him daily is, is the challenge. Keeping my eyes on him daily is the challenge. And there are days, brothers, where I will tell you I am sure that it would be easier if I was back inside. I miss those guys. I think about them all the time. I have dear friends inside. And so a big part of my life today is thinking about and working towards increasing the awareness of what this society is doing to men and women when we throw them away and lock up the key and just lock them up for life. And some of these men come out and yet we continue to ignore and walk by them and put obstacles up in front of them. I have a very good situation. 99.9% .9 of guys that come out don't have my situation. They are lonely. They don't have a place to go. They can't get a job. Many of them can't get bank accounts. It's hard. And yet we walk through it together. So um, it's, I, I want to close with this word of encouragement. As you think about your life, as you think about what it means to die daily so that we might have new life, be real with one another. Be brave. Real courage is not getting up and going to work every day trying to build an empire, guys. It's not that. Being brave is sitting down with someone and telling him about your pornography addiction. Telling him about how you have to drink every night so that you can sleep. Telling him about the lust or the affair. Having men in your life that you can do life with that's, that's what equips us to walk through this very challenging time. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be in a room filled with brothers who are trying to get there day by day. And I want you to know that there are other men in this community who, if you will welcome them, they will come and be a part of this. And quite literally, the complexion of this room will change. And you will be filled with a group of men who are more equipped to deal with the challenges of life than you'll ever, ever meet out here in the workplace because they've been through it. So it's Good Friday. The cross was why Jesus came. He had to die. And so do we. We have to die to get the new life. So let me just pray for a moment for us. And uh, I want to thank you again for letting me be here. Father, I just, uh, I'm so thankful for you. We are so grateful for who you are and what you have done, what you are doing and what you will do. I know you have a great plan. We want to be a part of it. Thank you for being with us this morning. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.